What's up guys, today I'd like to share with you an absolutely savage opening line that comes out of the first move pawn to e4 and black responding pawn to e5. It will definitely shock your opponent and will score a lot of nice victories for you. I'm Grandmaster Igor Smirnov and let's go ahead and get started. There is the classical way of going into it with knight to f3. There is also another way of starting with bishop to c4 and either way you can get in the, into the position that we want. So here let's say if you start off with knight to f3 and then you go bishop c4, pretending like you're playing just a classical opening. Here after knight to f6 you play pawn to d4, the first little surprise but it's still a book move so nothing extraordinary is happening right now. Then you castle. And since you're threatening pawn to e5, that will disturb the black knight from f6, they're likely to take this pawn because it doesn't seem like there is any danger here. And that's the moment where you're gonna shock your opponent by playing knight to c3. This is an extremely powerful gambit. I think it's just enough to say that Magnus Carlsen was defeated in 10 moves, literally, by white applying this gambit against them. It was a non-serious blitz game, but anyway, taking down Carlsen that quickly is, of course, something spectacular. We will now analyze the different lines, which are truly, truly a lot of fun. And because, for example, when Black takes here on c3, and you know, they can of course take with a knight, which we will talk about in a moment, but definitely if they want to refute the gambit, they gotta accept it. Because if they do not accept the sacrifice, then you have little risk, right? So they gotta try to accept it and refute the gambit th that way. But then you literally break through the Black's defense by playing bishop takes f7, inviting the Black's king for a dangerous walk. And after king takes, you're going queen to d5. And now you can kind of see the idea of this entire gambit called Nahmanson gambit. Here, your queen from d5 is attacking the king, and it's not that easy for this king to find a safe place. And you're gonna attack it. You're also having this nice open file that you can also use for your attack. And your pieces are almost fully developed. Your bishop or knight can jump to g5 at some point and join the attack. And even though you sacrificed already two minor pieces, all of your pieces are ready to take part into the attack and to hopefully checkmate Black's king. I'm gonna show you the juicy lines of this gambit in a moment, but before that, let me announce a quick Ask Me Anything event, because you guys are sending me a lot of questions, and unfortunately, not always I have the time or ability to answer them all, and that's why let's do it right now. So in the comments down below this video, you can ask me anything you want, not just about this video, but anything that you want, and I'll be happy to help you as much as I can. So shoot it down, and within the first two days, I'll be answering all the comments, and after that, it will depend on my availability. All right, let's continue with the gambit. Now, let's take a look at the black's options here. There aren't many ways for black, really, because going forward seems a bit crazy and risky, and if black wants to go backward, they're likely to choose the e8 square, as e7 is actually similar, but just a bit clumsy, it blocks out the other black species, and therefore most of your opponents will actually go king to e8, playing these most natural moves. And by the way, today I wanted to share this actionable piece of advice to you, because this gamut is not new, it's been there for like, 50 or even 70 years. But a lot of the books or tutorials about that cover some crazy lines that just never happen in real games. And I want to show you what your opponents are likely to play realistically and how you can win in this case. And now we're just going over the main line, something that your opponents will use most frequently against you. Now, here's another cool thing about this gambit. Instead of taking this knight right away, you're bringing the rook into play, because it pins down the knight, so it cannot run away anyway, and you're gonna capture this knight with the rook not only taking back one of your sacrificed pieces, but also involving one more piece into your attack. Now, what will black do here? Well, they need to cover their king, so they'll probably play bishop to e7. And then you follow your plan, you take the knight with the rook, and now you have these nice attacking pieces here. And in addition to that, you will likely to bring up either the bishop here on g5, or maybe in some variations the knight, to join the attack and to put even stronger pressure on black's position. At this point, black will probably play d6, it's the most played move and it makes sense to open up the bishop and to try to finish black's development somehow. Just in case, let me also mention that if they try playing pawn to h6 to take away the square from your pieces so that you can't bring your bishop out here to g5, there is a really amazing line here that you can use to finish the game right away. It's bishop takes h6. The move in a Mikhail Taz style, that's an amazing sacrifice. If they take it here with the rook, then we're deflecting the rook from protection of the bank rank, and it is actually a checkmate. The bishop is pinned, therefore it cannot cover the king, so it is actually a checkmate. Let's take him back, and if they take it with a pawn, 
instead of the rook if they take it with the pawn. Then you play queen to h5 check, now delivering this uh, right hook. And after king to f8, rook to f4, you can easily see that the king is nearly checkmated anyway. And let's say if they try to block, you go queen g6. Now they can stop you from taking the bishop on the next move and checkmating black's king very soon. So that's a really beautiful sideline that may actually happen in your games. Alright, let's come back to the main line. h6 is more of a sideline, but the main move is pawn to d6, the move which makes the most sense. Then you play bishop g5, a very common move in all of these variations, because you already have the rook which is pinning the bishop, and so you just want to bring more pressure onto the e-file, and on the next move you are ready to bring your other rook, and so your rooks will line up on this e-file to directly target black's king. Now what can they do here? If they take the pawn here on b2, that does not really help, because you're gonna execute your plan anyway and just bring this rook to e1. Of course you need to watch over this pawn so that black can never promote it, but since you've got this rook on e1, you have the first rank covered and nothing to worry about really. Let's take a move back, because right here it's already pretty clear that black's position is pretty dangerous here, it's, it's, it's gonna crush into, into the e7 square really soon. Therefore, instead of taking this pawn on b2, which in a way helps white to involve your rook from the corner, they usually play a rook to f8, because they're trying hard to keep up the position. Then you play a rook to e1, still doubling rooks across the e-file, and they play a rook to f7, trying to protect the bishop, again, makes sense. Then you trade here on e7, and you're actually winning the game here, regardless of what they do. They can either take it with a rook or with a knight, and both moves are equally bad. If they take it with a rook, then the good thing for you is that now you've got this queen g8 check. And you can either play it immediately, or you can first trade here on e7, and notice that the knight is pinned, therefore it can never do anything or can never move. Therefore, you can go inside with queen to g8 check, forcing the king to move, and after that you finish the game with a little combo, knight to e5 check, to open up the black king, and after that rook d1 delivers another check, and after king to c6, you can keep chasing the king, which is fine, or you can just win the queen, which is enough to win, because you, you, you won the queen, and his king is still exposed, therefore that is a clear win. Okay, let's come back, just a couple moves back, to one of the most critical positions of this variation. And here we analyze that after you take, it is losing for them to recapture with the rook. What if they take with the knight? It seems that temporarily the black's position is covered, but now you can bring up the knight into play by playing knight to g5, and together with the queen, you are now ready to grab the rook. Therefore, the rook will have to go. Let's say they play rook to f5 to attack your queen. Then you can still use a pretty similar tactical motif, just go queen to g8, Again, this knight is always pinned, so it can never take your queen, and therefore they'll have to move. And after that, either you can take here on e7 right away, that is winning, or you can take queen takes g7, just preparing, rook takes e7 on the next move, that is winning as well. In the game that we're analyzing, black tried to block it, but after rook takes, they failed across the d-file. Now rook d1 attacks both the king and the queen, and after king to e8, it was checkmate queen to f7. As you can see, it's a really cool line, because we're just going over the most played line, the most common defense of black, and it is completely failing for black who are winning here everywhere. Hope you're enjoying it so far, and of course, Magnus Carlsen is welcome to check out this video on how to refute the gambit, which we're gonna see in a moment. And anyway, <laughs> let's see what you can do here, as well as what your more advanced opponents will play against you. After e4 and pawn to e5, like I mentioned previously, there are a couple ways for you to get into the Nachmanson gambit, and I prefer doing this via the move bishop to c4, starting off with the bishop's opening. It's a very flexible opening that can lead into different cool positions to you. I have a separate video about this, which I'll link down below, that you may watch in case black plays any other moves which we're not covering today, because today we're focusing on black playing the mainstream moves, which lead into this Nachmanson Gambit. If they just take here on e4, and that is the Nachmanson Gambit, where you start with knight to c3, sacrificing the knight, and then you take here on f7, and after that you follow up with queen to d5 check. Alright, let's see what are the alternatives for black. Moving their king to either e7 or g6 doesn't make any sense, because in either case you will just win the knight with a tempo, and black will have to move their king once again, so that completely, that is completely meaningless for black. Let's say if they move here, you take a knight, they can't block the king anyway, so they'll have to move again, let's say to f7, and so you can see that black just wasted time going back and forth, and you won the knight and you keep up attacking, for example, knight g5, king g8, queen d5, checkmate, something like this. So that is clearly bad. Let's take a couple moves back. 
and figure out if there is a better alternative. The better alternative to these losing moves and king e8, which is also bad, is playing king to f6. This is of course a computer move. It's very hard for a human to play a move like that, exposing your king, putting it on such an advanced, dangerous position. But computer says that if black follows up with very precise moves, they are okay. Now, what are you going to do? You're going to play rook to e1, still following the main idea here. Instead of taking the knight right away, you want to involve the rook into play. And the knight cannot really go away, because in this case, you, you've got bishop g5 check, which will attack the king as well as the queen. Therefore, the knight cannot really go away from here anyway. And what they need to do is to play another computer move, knight to e7, trying to def remove your queen from here. And after queen takes e4, they have two options. One of them is the losing one, the other one is a good one, so they gotta make the right choice. The natural move pawn to d5, which a lot of them will play against you, is also losing, because after a queen to f4, they need to block, and here there are different ways for you to proceed. The simplest is just to play pawn to g4 and say, hey, let me take the piece back and continue the attack without any sacrifices, because now you're gonna take this bishop back on the next move or one of the next moves, and the black skin is still deadly exposed, therefore that, that is clearly good for you. So that's not the way for a black to try and refute your idea. And the way to do that is instead of playing d5, to move the king back to f7. Again, very strange moves by black, so that is clearly the computer's suggestion. But if your opponent is prepared, they may try this against you. Now, you're still going bishop g5, as always here. They, then they play pawn on d5, and here you play queen to f4 check. So far, everything's pretty logical. They need to move their king to the corner, then you play queen to h4 aiming to win this knight, taking advantage of the pin along the d-file, and if you could possibly really win the knight, then again you will take a piece back and continue the attack at no cost, that will be great. But the problem here is that they've got a counter blow, knight to g6, which saves their position, because now they say, hey, you're attacking our queen, but we are attacking yours. And therefore, after this exchange, bishop takes, knight takes, bishop takes, it's this force in line, it ends up into this endgame position where black is a pawn up, assuming that on the next move you're gonna collect this pawn on b2, and even though black is a pawn up, and normally black has an advantage here, but I just checked in the database that white has something like 86% success rate, which is crazy, because black's position normally should be better here, but, I mean, in a real practical game, you know, your position is much more active than black's one, because they're all of their pieces are still on the last rank, they'll still need to spend a lot of time bringing them all into play, and therefore, after you take also this here, the rook on, on b2, it'll become active across the b-file, therefore it's definitely not easy for black to play, and even though it's a good line for black to play, it probably cannot really be called a refutation, because, again, white is getting great results here, actually, in this line. All right, now let's see how black can finally refute the gambit. There must be some refutation, right? Why is playing, playing crazy moves while black didn't play any error early in the game and therefore they should not really be crushed that badly. All right, and also let me show you one more way into getting into the gambit position. Instead of playing bishop c4 first, you may also start by playing pawn to d4 first. You see, there can be different move order, but that'll lead to the same position. Here you're using the Scotch Gambit. Like I mentioned, I've got a separate video about this opening as well that I'll link down below. And here after knight f6, you castle, and we're getting the same position. Now after knight takes, you're sacrificing the knight here. And what if they take with the knight? If black says, okay, if taking with a pawn is so dangerous, let me just, uh, you know, decline the sacrifice and just get some normal position. And what if they take with the knight? That's actually the way Carlson tried to proceed here. And after a pawn takes, black goes pawn to d5, looks cool, attacks the bishop, wins some tempo, bishop goes here, and now black can take one more pawn onto c3. Like I mentioned, that is how Carlson tried to refute the gambit in his blitz game, and it actually fails. Because even though it looks like black is doing great, but in reality, it's not quite the case. Black is actually losing after the move knight to e5. And here's the problem, black is underdeveloped. And they spend a couple of times being a couple of temples being greedy and uh, grabbing the white pawns here in the center. And during this time, you manage to put this active bishop. Also, you've got the open e file that you can easily use against black's king. And right now, you're threatening this knight on c6. And because of all of these threats, black's position is falling apart real quick. For example, if they play bishop d7 to protect this knight, there is a forcing continuation which leads to a winning position. First of all, you trade some pieces to clear the e-file, and after that you give check here, they gotta cover with the bishop, and then you play bishop 
a3. That's the key move of this whole tactical operation. Because now, thanks to this pin, and thanks to the support of the bishop, you're gonna take on e7 on the next move, winning material. And that's how white really crushes here very, very quickly while black seemingly played all the most natural moves. For example, if black takes here, you just take on e7, and after this massive trade and queen takes d5, you can see that you just won a queen, the black's king is still exposed, you can attack it, let's say queen c5 or some other move, rook to e1, and it's clear that not only white will get a material advantage, but will keep attacking the black's king, and that is completely winning. And here comes the spoiler, it can't be all that good for white, right? There must be some variation that can refute this little bit suspicious looking gambit. And there we go. After e4, pawn to e5, knight f3, knight to c6. By the way, I just turned the table and now you're looking at the position from the black perspective so that if someone uses this Nachmanns and Gambit against you, you know what to do so that you're on the right side of a 10 move victory. Now, let's say they go bishop c4, knight f6, pawn to d4. So far, we know these moves from the white perspective. Knight c3, here you take with the knight. That is the safest option, even though it is possible to take with the pawn and go into those crazy complicated variations that we analyzed previously and like we discussed one of them is actually good for black but it leads to very sharp position and very dangerous and just one wrong move can immediately cost you the game that is why it's certainly easier to decline it and after that here is the critical moment instead of playing d5 the most obvious move to try to win the tempo it's better to play bishop e7 what's the point here well, you keep everything really, really solid and well protected. Now, after they take here on d4, because what else can they really do? Then you play pawn to d5, and if they play bishop b5 at this point, you've got the time to castle. If you remember, into the previous game, black failed due to white playing knight e5 and exploiting this pin, right? But now you're in time to castle, and therefore you have no problems whatsoever, and black is simply a pawn up. Therefore, it's not completely winning, but well, you're a pawn up, so that should normally bring you advantage and if you play proper moves next you're gonna win the game so that's how black can refute this gamut if anyone tries playing this against you all right hope you enjoy this don't forget to ask your questions in the comments down below because i'll be answering them on the first come first served basis so if you have some questions about chess or about me or anything that i can possibly answer comment down below and i will make sure to follow up with you also, if you're interested in improving your chess, you may wish to check out my free masterclass, The Best Way to Improve a Chess Instantly, where I'm showing you some of my best methods that can help you to get this rapid, tremendous progress in chess. Thank you very much for watching and best of luck in your chess battles.